Ben, we tend to focus on the numbers. We tend to focus on evidence-based approaches to player evaluation, to strategy and tactics, how we can build in these structural advantages. But as you and I were talking pre-show, I mean, it's not that we don't enjoy the human element and interested in the human element as well. And one of the big moves, obviously kind of the headlining move there in round one was this just gigantic trade where A.J. Brown goes to the Philadelphia Eagles. They select Traylon Burks to fill that slot. And the rhetoric coming out of Tennessee is that uh, he's just going to be a touch and volume monster. So that kind of, that makes us happy because we were both very high on Burks during the draft process. One of the things that I had said was that even though, and, and Pat Corain, who was so fantastic on the stream, also joined Column and me on Road of His Overtime this week. He had a bunch of good stuff there. And Pat is just, I mean, he's a superstar. One of the things that he was noting was just, you know, <laughs> sometimes at this point, Ben, it can be hard to keep our enthusiasm in check and realize that the very top comp for every player is not going to be how these guys turn out. So it's going to be hard for Traylon Burks to be anything like A.J. Brown, even though that's the comp that we, you know, in the back of our minds all wanted to make. But that part is good for him. It also, I mean, this is one where I think it's a win-win right now. A.J. Brown goes and gets to play in Philadelphia. That situation, you know, I had made the case, I think they're going to be more aggressive than they've said than they were last year. But also, you know, you were filling me in on some human interests, which I think is really cool as well. Yeah, shout out to Jared Evans from PFF. Uh, I got a great bit of information this morning from Twitter from him and uh, completely put me in a fantastic mood, set my whole day in the right direction. And that is that apparently Jalen Hurts and AJ Brown are best friends. They're best friends. There's all these quotes. Jared had shared some of them. Um, AJ Brown said, I get to play with my best friend and it's just great to be a part of this great organization. Uh, he said, it's going to be real special. I'm so excited playing with someone who thinks like me. I talk to him every day, regardless of this football stuff. I'm so excited to play with him. He's a quarterback and I'm a receiver. So we get on the same page quick. He had, uh, uh there was some additional stuff that talked about where this relationship started. It started when AJ Brown was being recruited to Alabama, which obviously was not successful. And Brown ended up uh, attending Ole Miss, obviously, but they hit it off. They stayed in touch. Uh, and so Brown's additional quotes were, I think when you, when you run into good people, I think you just try to stay close to them. He was one person that I considered a really good friend who always looked out for me, and here we are. Um, and then apparently, just a week before the draft, Hertz was at Brown's two-year-old daughter's birthday party, and they had a little throwing session that apparently made some buzz on the internet. I had not heard about this. And they were joking that maybe they would play together. And Brown's other quotes were in the middle of the throwing session, Jalen said he was going to ask them to trade for me. We was just laughing and joking. We had no idea that this would happen. So I retweeted all that and I, I was talking about it. And then people in my mentions also threw out one, one said, and this is unconfirmed, but Jalen is apparently the godfather of his child, which is potentially why he was at this birthday party. And uh, Benjamin Robinson, who does the awesome grinding, the mocks website all through draft season, shared um, a still from A.J. Brown's draft day, the call that he got from the Titans in 2019. And Jalen Hurts is right there while he's on the phone patting him on the back. These guys are like best friends. I mean, that's you didn't need to give me a reason to be completely all in on A.J. Brown, but I'm completely sold. I'm going to draft him in every single league. His new quarterback's his best friend. He's his godfather to his daughter. So, Ben, I'm looking up my redraft tiers now and i mean aj brown's got to move up right so tier one cup chase jefferson tier two debo who we know has some regression issues might not be on the 49ers although we think that he will be Devonte adams still confident for him because he's also going to play with his best friend i mean if we're if we're doing best friend uh inflate the the rankings here Stefan Diggs, Tyreek Hill. We need to check and see if there's the best friend connection in, in that situation. T. Higgins, AJ Brown, and CD Lamb. I think that you're going to want me to move AJ Brown up at least a couple spots there. 
Yeah, I mean, how, where's Cooper Cup in your rankings? <laughs> he's he's number one. Okay, so a couple spots ahead of there would be good. <laughs> so into the the one plus tier. Yes, that's that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, no, I'm. I mean, in all seriousness, I do think this is a good thing. I mean, I'm actually willing to to put real weight to this. You want um, the, the QB wide receiver familiarity, I think is a, a huge element. I think it's a huge element why we see wide receivers who change teams, not necessarily perform as well on their new teams. I've been r- grappling with that as it relates to Brown, the fact that they've actually gotten throwing sessions on their own and their friends and they talk in the off season and they tend to be, you know, each other's kids birthdays and things like this. And, and they um, talk about football. You know, he said that they, they're going to see the things the same way. It's somebody who thinks like him. They're going to get on the same page quickly. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely willing to put a little bit of weight onto that and say, okay, at least as it relates to my concern about him changing teams, which as Rich Rebar, and I, I always reference him on this, has, has often said, you don't see the best, very best receivers change teams like this. What you see is, guys coming off career years that their team kind of knows they can't pay him the full amount and they let him walk and then he is already probably due for some regression and then you have some of the other elements like a new quarterback and a new offensive scheme that maybe play into it I would be as concerned about AJ Brown first of all changing teams because he's AJ Brown he's a guy who can do so much by himself but to the extent that I was concerned at all I'm willing to kind of wipe away some of that and just be like look he's going into a situation now where um, he definitely is going to have his quarterbacks here. Uh, they have a very strong relationship. We don't have to worry about there being any kind of animosity in the locker room or any, you know, any of these off the field things that can potentially end up being a reason that a guy might not succeed in a new spot where, you know, again, we don't always know how to quantify these things, but one of the reasons that guys probably continue to su- succeed in the spots that they're in is they build these relationships and things right over multiple years. Um, so maybe it's just a, uh, a lack of familiarity with a new quarterback after having a strong familiarity, what have you, but Hertz is going to, uh, or excuse me, Brown is going to a spot with Hertz where he has that familiarity. I would argue and have argued that Ryan Tannehill didn't throw to AJ Brown as much as he should have. He did. He started to this past year. I, I think the year before, especially, I think their last play of the season, the year before was a, a fourth down when the Titans lost in the playoffs and he ended up going, you know, over the middle or something that got knocked down. But AJ Brown was just running free. And I remember tweeting about this. And he had these plays, Tannehill, where he would pre-snap sort of decide he was going to look the other way from AJ Brown's side of the field and never really make his way back over there or make a read back to Brown's side. But they were in a spot where they needed to score late. They were losing. Um, this was the 2020 season playoffs, and he Brown ran right by the defense, and it's like you have your best player on a fourth down, and he's going to go score the go-ahead touchdown, and you end up throwing because he was already locked into the other side of the field. This is sort of the the way that I remember this play, but I saw a lot of that throughout Brown's last couple of years. I've obviously watched him very closely, where there are just kind of plays that Tannehill seems not to even come back to the side of the field where AJ Brown is because he's sort of made his pre-snap read, and a lot of times it worked out fine. You know, he's, I think he's done a good job with that. He's been efficient and he's gotten the ball to players that are open. But we might get a little bit more forced targets to A.J. Brown is what I'm getting at. Anyway, I'm actually legitimately very excited about this. So forced targets, some forced deep targets. We look at the situation there and potential for Hertz to be sort of this over-the-top quick strike type of passer. And even though Devontae Smith and Dallas Scott are very good, we could see a very, very concentrated passing offense to where it's basically those three guys, to where they don't throw a lot to the peripheral receivers, they don't throw a lot to the running back. And even if it's on a smaller pie, if we get A.J. Brown up there in that, you know, the top kind of reasonable level would be sort of 30 to 32% target share. And if he does that, you know, with some good deep targets mixed in and then it's just really a matter if he stays healthy i mean even in this bad situation in tennessee people will be looking at him in a very different light if he had been healthier over the last couple of years when you look at that group in tier two there are the two guys who really have some sort of overall offensive pass volume concerns are debo and aj brown 
the 49ers offense is so good and so consistent, so established. It has such an identity that the idea that they would flip and become this aggressive passing offense, especially with Trey Lance, seems to be a very, very narrow kind of path or very unlikely scenario. We know that the rhetoric out of Philadelphia has also suggested that they're going to remain run heavy, but the actions in this case suggest a little bit the opposite, at least to getting maybe more back to the middle. And as we know, the Philadelphia Eagles were incredibly run heavy in all offensive situations last year. I don't know. I, I kind of like this move almost for all of their guys because of what I think it may signal. Yeah, that's a fantastic. Um, I mean, ultimately, for Philly, it's not sort of a question of whether they will throw more. It's a question of how much. They were so run heavy at times last year. They had a stretch in our running bound ceiling signals where their pass rate over expectation was at least 10 percentage points lower than expectation, which is a lot. Um, for like five or six consecutive weeks. Every single week, it was ranging from like negative 12% to negative 17%. And negative 17% is like, we're talking one of the three lowest of the entire season. They All of those games, as I was mentioning in Ceiling Signals at this time, were in the bottom maybe 30 to 50 games of any team for the entire year. And it was week after week after week. There was It didn't matter the game situation. It was absolutely no way that happens again. There's no possible way. Right. It just can't happen again. The question is, will they be in this slightly below average range because they have a mobile quarterback or will they actually have sort of a Baltimore like rise last year where Baltimore winds up in an above average pass volume uh, situation where they have guys like Mark Andrews who suddenly runs over 600 routes in a season. He had never run more than like 350 because they had never thrown they never dropped back anywhere close to 600 times over the, the previous years of his career. Suddenly he's running 600 routes in a year and that's really, you know, changes things for Mark Andrews. If the Eagles have a season like that, where they get up around 600 pass attempts, right. And you have AJ Brown and Devonta Smith running routes, basically every play, which we would expect. And Dallas Goddard for that matter, you're going to, yeah, you're going to be fine. Basically I'm with you. I think the, the pie is going to be consolidated, right. The, the target shares will be consolidated on those three. You probably have, I don't know if Jalen Rager will still be there or Quez Watkins mixing in, but I don't think those guys will be factor. I mean, I like Quez Watkins a lot, but I don't think those guys are going to be factoring a lot in uh, a passing game that includes AJ Brown and Devonta Smith as the top two weapons. And I, I said on the stream that I think Dallas Goddard is the one that gets dinged the most by AJ Brown um, as you know, he sort of becomes now from being one of the, the clear top two to, to sort of being in my mind, the, the clear third, um, but yeah, I mean, it's where you're kind of talking through where you would rank Brown in redraft. And I guess I want to know where you would, because I'm not the right person for the listeners to listen to on this. You could rank him literally anywhere and I'm going to make sure to get some exposure to him. I'm serious. Like you could put a wide receiver one and I'm going to draft him in some leagues. I'm not going to play a season without AJ Brown on my roster. So it really almost like you're kind of saying those other guys in that tier, where would I move him up to? It really doesn't matter where you put him. I'm going to take him over the guy ahead of him at least a couple of times. So where do you see him fall? Because the, the people who are not as biased as me want to know, at what price is he too expensive to, to not get any exposure to? I think it's tough because he goes in this tier where I think you do want exposure to those guys, right? We know what some of the concerns are with Debo, but I think you have to have – some shares with the type of player that he is if one of the things that comes out of all of this trade drama is that he gets them to dial back his rush attempts which he seems to want then that that's going to actually be huge for fantasy because he had to be essentially a Barry Sanders highlight reel as a runner to keep sustaining the production once he was losing those targets Devonta Adams, I think you have to have exposure even with the Raiders. I mean, he's he's going to remain awesome. Stephon Diggs, there are some bounce back opportunities. I wrote an article on Diggs, but he wants to check that out on the site, mentioning what I actually do see as a couple of red flags. But even with that, you know, you want exposure in that range. I think you want exposure to both Hill and Waddle. I mean, in some ways, you probably want more Waddle. I think that 
people are going to see that Hill was perhaps propped up a little bit more by Patrick Mahomes than that it seemed like. But I mean, you can't go without taking Tyreek Hill once he's moved down in price after this trade. And then, you know, the other kind of two guys there, you have T Higgins and CD Lamb. And are you going to not get exposure to those players? Because the Bengals could go in a much more aggressive path this season at least for the whole year because they weren't in the early part of last year right and we are looking at higgins you know sort of upper third results they're very impressive they talked about how he had taken this big jump between seasons and then we didn't really see that but one of the things is he he suffered multiple injuries that really didn't allow him to do what we know that he can do and played with those injuries and so people when they're looking at just his profile you know in the games he played i mean those are a lot of those games are hurt games and so you you put him back in there healthy with a more aggressive offense you you just even for aj brown you can't totally push him to the side and then so much of what the cowboys have done this season is to unleash cd lamb and so i think you have to be a little bit concerned there that lamb wasn't able to more or less just, just unleash himself but you know, we do have some of these situations where quarterbacks are like, I got lots of guys open. I'm, I'm going to take the open person. I mean, one of the, the big storylines with the draft was Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, Jamison Williams. You know, there are a lot of people who will tell you, and, and Scott made this this point on the OT podcast, which is that, you know, Williams is actually wide open on a lot of those plays they're throwing to the other guys. It's like you can only get so wide open at some point. You know, it's the quarterback's choice and not your own. Once the quarterback looked his way, obviously we got a massive season from him. So I do think the fact that the Cowboys seem much more determined to actually use Lamb as the star and let him pull them to victory is going to make a difference. I just, I, I do want to point out that note that you know, make sure you mix it up a little bit because I think all of these guys are good. Also, I think that there's actually a big teardrop after this. And so the frustrating thing is that we can't maybe get somebody from that next tier who really has the value jump but once we go a couple of tiers down ben we do have another big move here with marquise brown going to the arizona cardinals the other shoe unfortunately does drop and we find that one of the reasons for that at least was that deandre hopkins is going to be suspended for the first six games you know perhaps this is a will fuller kind of situation where you know once he comes back from that he's actually super awesome for a while but we now have to move Hopkins well down. We get to move Brown up. And I have Brown now in this group of players. This is tier five. So there are obviously some people in between that we're, we're not mentioning. But I have him with Ayuk, Sutton, Mike Williams, Drake London, Traylon Burks. So right in between Sutton and Williams there with the rookies who appear to be you know set to get a ton of volume right off the bat. Uh, just right behind him and then terry mclaurin who you know i joked as being completely undraftable and jerry judy in the couple spots that i actually have mclaurin and judy one more tier breakdown but that's kind of the group of players is that where you see marquise brown's value being we know that he probably doesn't have the ceiling of you know a first or second round kind of guy but the overall numbers there in arizona could be pretty good and then obviously it, depending on what your focus is if you're mostly focused on how do i win tournaments i mean <laughs> already with baltimore we see individual games where his air yards are off the chart and it's a matter of how many of those touchdowns does he drop because you could have a 40 point game yeah and he's another one where he played college football with his new quarterback he he knows kyler murray very well um i had a couple comments actually on that sort of second round receiver tier you were talking about. I loved your thoughts on T Higgins sort of playing through injuries and things. I mean, he's one that out of that group stuck out to me is like definitely want exposure to him. If the, if the Bengals continue to throw at a high rate, we didn't see the best of T Higgins last year and we were very excited for him. You were very excited for him. We joked how you had him rounds ahead of a reasonable place to rank him last year. And we, we saw, why at times we saw enough for me last year to be completely bought into the long-term 
reasoning to be in on that. It just wasn't a great outcome from him, for him in an injury perspective. And now you have Jamar Chase sort of overshadowing him. And you get this nice little discount where I think it's more like Higgins is the 1B than the number 2 to Chase. And so, yeah, it's not it's not a huge discount. But he's a guy that could just have a monster a monster 2022. And if they block a little bit better, then even some of those targets that you don't think about, the ones to the tight end, and obviously they're churning the tight end position, those targets to the running back, those could go to the receivers. And so it doesn't even have to come from Tyler Boyd, which also is a very real possibility. Yeah, but we're still going to probably be taking plenty of Tyler Boyd as well, because it is, I mean, he's going to be such a fun pick again, is this, you know, high floor, high ceiling play, small miss, big hit type play, where if something were to happen to either uh, Chase or Higgins, and obviously we're going to be hoping that nothing does because we're going to be on those guys as well. But Boyd's going to have plenty of room to move up and people are going to say he's the afterthought and, and he's just such a clear, easy, early target. At, at his I don't want to make it too big of a deal about it, but like such an easy pick right now from that small miss, big hit sort of mindset. But as you talk through all those second year guys, you mentioned Higgins, Lamb, you know, several others. And you said it's a bummer because there's that tear break behind it. I was also thinking in terms of draft structure and how we have been talking about sort of the dead zone being more running back centric. And it just feels like that makes me want to get as many of those receivers before the CD Lamb T Higgins group and then take a running back in the third. Because there's running backs you can get in the third. They don't have very massively different profiles from at least the late first round running backs, right? Maybe a little bit different from the very high end top of the first round running backs, the Jonathan Taylors, but this ability to stack two, or maybe if you're lucky, a third of those, those, that top sort of group of receivers, those top couple tiers before that drop off and then hit running back, maybe in the fourth where there are some interesting running back names as your anchor and then go back to receiver I don't know. As you were talking through that drop off at receiver, I, I, I started thinking, okay, well, you know, the the whole idea with zero RB is it's not that we have to take only. I mean, it's basically that we can get that same second round receiver that people that want to take a first round running back want to get, but also with a first round receiver. Now we have more of them, and maybe a third round receiver as well. Now we have so much firepower at receiver. It's about getting the second and the third and the fourth of those receivers, and so getting a couple of those in those really high leverage rounds and then hitting running back might be an interesting way to be playing drafts right now. Um, and Ben, one of the things you mentioned with that and is very relevant after, as we do this kind of sifting through and, and letting the draft settle type of episode, I don't get the impression and, you know, definitely correct me if I'm wrong here, but you did not get the sense that the Jaguars are that worried about the ETN recovery. You didn't get the sense that the Ravens are that worried about the Dobbins recovery. You didn't get the sense that the Giants felt like they were going to need to add to Saquon Barkley. I mean, he could be... One of the things last year is that he actually lost a huge amount of work to Devontae Booker. I mean, there are guys in that risky range, that third round range, uh, you know, obviously Dobbins with the potential Melvin Gordon rumors was you know, going fifth, sixth turn there, because if Gordon went there, that would be, I mean, I do think it's a case where Javante Williams drops with the Melvin Gordon resigning, but Melvin Gordon was going to have a bigger impact on JK Dobbins than he was going to have on just going back to Javante Williams, I think. Yeah. But now those guys, I mean, in some ways it's almost bad, but we're cleared for takeoff on ETN and Dobbins. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited about getting exposure to those guys. Um, and I, I wrote in a recent post about Williams, uh, as you mentioned, the Gordon thing. I don't know if we've talked about it on the show yet, but essentially that we we learned some stuff from Gordon looking all through free agency for a multi-year deal and from deals from other places and then having to come back essentially to Denver on a, on a shorter term deal, a one-year deal. And essentially that's that the Broncos were – Certainly happy to have a very good player from 2021 back, but also we're okay with him leaving if he would have got that other deal. And I made a comparison to Christian McCaffrey's second season when Jonathan Stewart was a big part of Christian McCaffrey's first season, and then he left, and then people were very excited about McCaffrey. And then in May, the Panthers signed C.J. Anderson that offseason off a 1,000-yard year with the Broncos. 
And everyone said, okay, CJ Anderson's taking the Jonathan Stewart role and, and McCaffrey's not going to get an increase in work. He's not going to get that early down work. He's a late second round pick. And the Panthers cut CJ Anderson by the middle of that season. And CJ Anderson was still good. He went on to have a really good end of the year with the Rams. He picked up with them and, and played good football into the playoffs for them. But they had already kind of told us by May in the early part of free agency, they were not concerned about that second running back spot. They were, they were going to be committing to, to McCaffrey and, I don't know. I'm, I'm definitely taking the Broncos path from the start of free agency to the one year deal that they gave Melvin Gordon the week of the draft, which I actually speculated might have been because the Broncos went to Gordon and said, look, you're not finding a lot out there. And it's a lot of these teams, worse. a lot of these teams think they can address it in the draft. But we also, if you're not going to sign with us, are maybe going to address it in the draft. And like, why else would Gordon sign the week of the draft and not wait until after and see if there was still an opening somewhere else for him? I think. You know, that was just sort of my speculation, but maybe the Broncos did let on. Hey, we're happy to have you back, but if you're not back by the draft, we're gonna we're gonna draft somebody. <laughs> we're, we're gonna get another running back. So anyway, maybe the Broncos have a, a trade set up there with the Texans. They can they can still move him. Yeah, the Texans the one the one team that still doesn't have really anybody on their running back that chart. Yeah, um, but my my take on on that to just to sum it up is that those two guys might be in sort of a similar 50-50 split to start the year, but. We're going to pretty quickly, and I, I think I said in my article, the, I think the most likely scenario is by about week three, you're going to see Javante Williams on the, the 60 side of a 60-40 and pretty quickly get into the 65-35 split where Williams is the lead back. It's not – the way that it was in 2021 is going to be in a lot of people's mind, but um, what happened this offseason was an indication that they are – and it's a whole new coaching staff, right? A whole new staff has come in, different offense. I don't think that's where the Broncos have told us they're going is that that 2022 is going to be the same as 2021. So don't fall into that trap. Still very excited about Javante Williams. But yeah, you were talking about Marquise Brown. we got to circle back to him. Um, I, I think that's a, the tier you asked about, I think is a, is a interesting tier. I kind of felt like, as you were saying the names that I maybe wanted back in the Judy tier. So I want you to sell me on him a little bit. It is a really nice uptick for him in terms of, expected team volume and all of those things i guess i'm a little bit concerned obviously the ravens threw a lot more last year i'm a little bit concerned about number one all the targets not in the first six weeks necessarily but obviously when hopkins comes back he's still gonna he's a prominent enough player that he's still gonna play a lot and be very involved immediately upon his return more or less he's not gonna have to work his way back into the offense you have Ertz, you have rondell moore you have a lot of other guys I think Brown will certainly have the the uh, ability to be a, a, an efficient player, but I'm a little concerned about sort of, you know, how much of a target share he can immediately earn in Arizona. But you had him in a tier with some really interesting names when you were asking me where I have him at. And it got me a little bit thinking more about the, the optimistic side. What, you know, what are you thinking like you can certainly see a very efficient and productive year for him as a much better player than a lot of the guys that Kyler was throwing to last year. And, and a lot of them were very efficient. Kyler is a good quarterback. Yeah, there's going to be just so much scoring going on there. And so, I mean, you look at him being able to actually demand 27% of the targets last year. I mean, the only guys finishing with more air yards – than Brown last season for Justin Jefferson, Stephon Diggs, Terry McLaurin, DJ Moore, Tyreek Hill, and Jamar Chase. And obviously the guys who were able to convert a little bit in Hill, Chase, and Jefferson, you're talking about your superstars, McLaurin and DJ Moore, you're talking about all the guys who are there sitting on benches at the end because their quarterbacks can't complete any passes. But that's the reason that McLaurin and Moore continue to sit in the ranges that they sit at because people understand the peripherals and what – they bring to the table in terms of getting open, demanding not just targets, but a specific kind of target and allowing their team to succeed as a result of that. If the quarterback play is there and you just mentioned with Kyler Murray, that it's going to be there. And again, we're looking at a situation where probably the things that Murray does well fit with what Brown does. Now, one of the things I was writing recently, I think it was after you and I took Bateman in a rookies and sophomores draft, but was just that Bateman's numbers weren't that great last season, but over the the last half to third of the season, 
his numbers in uh, terms of yards per route and some of these other things were actually better than Brown's, despite the fact that Brown was targeted so much more because Brown was that inefficient. And I think that you have a couple of things that come into play there. Normally, I like to talk about, you know, don't necessarily just chase inefficiency. I mean, I wouldn't chase Terry McLaurin's situation. You know, don't chase and don't fade guys who are awesome. And the reason you're getting fantasy points over expectation, the reason you're getting some of these high yards per target numbers, which as you mentioned, is one of the parts that actually does come into play pretty meaningfully in the, the yards per route run type of number. You know, those guys, the reason those numbers are there is because they dictate that they are there. It doesn't mean they're going to be there every week. I mean, you're going to have those numbers bounce around on a weekly basis, but when you're looking at full season play, the chance for these guys to outperform, that's very important. You want to have exposure to the actual good players with brown i i think it could go both directions to where i don't think that he continues to drop those passes i mean there was such high leverage on a handful of his long touchdown drops that it completely changes the way that his season looks he also wasn't necessarily getting great quarterback play after lamar jackson was injured I thought those guys came in and moved the, moved the ball, right? I mean, it was in some ways similar to what Jameis Winston was doing for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, where you're like, I'm, I'm glad that these guys have the guts to to fight, to move the ball, to put us in position where we could still potentially win, even though we know the Ravens lost basically all of those games. But now you go to this situation with the Arizona Cardinals, where you're going to have some other guys who are also focal points. The defense can't focus on you. You're going to have that good run game, along with it in terms of the, some of the things that James Conner can bring to the table. We like some of the backups. Kyler Murray with the, the rushing that he brings. I mean, Marquise Brown's a viable fantasy wide receiver, even when it was Lamar Jackson and them running the ball every play. And we're not going to necessarily get that, or hopefully we don't get that with the Arizona Cardinals. That's not what they're setting up to do. The other thing that we could see here is that Brown could score you so many points during DeAndre Hopkins' suspension that in a lot of different league formats, I mean, if you're getting off to a, you know, a five and one, a six and zero start, then you can actually sustain a lesser performance from him going forward. You know, if, if you're talking about trying to win the FFPC main event, you're trying to win that million dollars. If you are out there as one of the top scoring teams in the entire contest, you know, through six weeks, if you've kind of gapped your own division, I mean, the first thing you have to do, people talk about how do you win these big tournaments and one of the points that I do like to make, I don't think this is, you know, anything earth shattering or profound, but before you focus on winning the tournament, make sure that you make the playoff portion, right? In the seasons that I've had the best luck, so much of it is that I got so many teams through that then you have a lot of different types of things that could go right for you in the tournament portion. I think that when you're looking at winning the FFPC main event, Marquise Brown could be a big part of, you know, getting to that tournament in the first place. 